Ryan asks, After reading this week's coursework, I was interested in checking out the Blockchain Explorer on Blockchain.com. I saw a mining pool named F2 Pool quite often, and I noticed that on October 3rd, 2019, they mined 18 blocks. Is it fair to assume then that this pool alone potentially made a gross profit of $1.8 million in one day, not including transaction fees? What are the economics of these pools? How much of that $1.8 million is potentially profit? Well, um, it depends. It depends on the electricity cost, operational cost, and hardware cost of the miners who are participating. Now, keep in mind, and this is really, really important: mining pools are not miners. Miners are the people with the hardware. Mining pools are the coordinators who uh, help the miners collaborate so they can smooth out their earnings. So it's not the mining pool that mine these things. It's actually the miners who participate in that pool who mined uh, these blocks. And how much of that 1.8 million was profit? We don't know. The profit ranges between uh, zero in many cases. Some of these are not profitable. Uh, and in some cases, up to 30 percent um, or more when uh, the cost of electricity is low, the price of Bitcoin is high, the hash rate of a specific miner is high, and they are able to get lots and lots of blocks, and even more so when the transaction fees are high. So the profit margin depends on all of these factors, which are highly, highly individualized. Different miners have different profit margins and operating costs, which actually is a great way for the system to dynamically balance. Ryan asks, Given the race by both users with fees and miners with hashing, is it possible that some wallets secretly working with certain pools can send transactions directly to the mempool of those mining pools first, or a few seconds before everybody else, and give them a slight edge to build an ideal block or create uh, higher fees? Uh, yes. This is in fact possible, uh, not just possible, it has happened. There are times in the network where miners have uh, created their own transactions uh, with elevated fees, injected them into the mempool of various mining pools that they are well connected to, uh, where they get propagated very, very fast, uh, causing the mempool to have lots of high fee transactions. Uh, and then uh, that causes all of the other users who want to put in transactions to elevate their fees. Um, now, this is a strategy that is very risky. If a miner that is constructing these in collaboration with uh, some wallet that they've built to do this, to jam high fee transactions into the mempool in order to elevate the prices, if that miner isn't actually mining those transactions, Effectively, they are spending these fees and paying the other miner that ended up mining these transactions. So this strategy only works for miners who have a very high percentage of the hash rate, so they can recoup some of the fees they are spending trying to jam the market. Of course, if all miners are doing this, and they do this kind of collusion, then what happens is that fees can be elevated. However, keep in mind, from a game theory perspective, if you are one of the miners and you notice all of your colleagues are jamming transactions with high fees into the mempool to drive up fees, what you can do is sit back, not pay a thing, and let them drive up fees while you just earn them by mining, and you are not risking these transactions that might be mined by someone else, which means that you make as much money as they make per your hashing power uh, from the higher fees, but you are not spending money to create these higher fees. Well, if you think about it, if everybody do, does that, then nobody is willing to take the risk of creating the high fee transactions, um, because those would benefit all of the other miners, and they'd be taking on all of the costs. It's a classic tragedy of the commons scenario, and in this particular case, it works the benefit of users because this only works if there is a lot of collusion between a lot of miners who have a lot of hash power during a time when fees are already high and there's some kind of political fight going on, which is why this happened mostly in the summer preceding the hard fork 
um, of Bitcoin Cash and the huge debate over scaling, where people wanted to make a point about how full the system was. Now, it may happen from time to time again, uh, but it is a risky strategy for miners that they can only pull off when there is a lot of collusion, and where miners can easily reap all the benefits and pay none of the costs by taking advantage of that. So it's a, a losing strategy most of the time. Ran asks, why can the proof of work algorithm prevent one party from dominating the record keeping? A 51% attack can happen, which means the attacker can change the whole chain. This is a really important question, Ran, and, and a, often it's a misconception among many people. A 51 attack, a 51% attack can happen. The second part of your sentence, however, is not true, which means the attacker can change the whole chain. No, they can't. The attacker can, using a 51% attack, change the next block, and in fact, be the only one in the long term that is producing blocks. Because once you have 51% of the hashing power, you can generate blocks faster than the rest of the network which means that you can have the dominant chain, which means from the moment you get 51%, and into the future, you get to choose which transactions go into blocks. And that gives that miner one very important power. They can cause the network to reorganize, effectively making some of the blocks that were recently mined be, be um, reorganized out of the chain, and replace them with their own blocks, so they can effectively make a transaction disappear. Um, only for the recent chain, maybe the last four, five, six blocks at most. That's why we say that we look for six confirmations before perhaps shipping something or allowing a withdrawal from an exchange. And the reason that all of these um, economic interests on the network insist on six blocks six confirmations before uh, assuming that a transaction is irreversible, is because in the chance of a 51% attack, you may see reorganizations as big as six blocks, but the longer you look, the harder it is. So if you want to do a one-block reorganization, that happens fairly often. A two-block reorganization happens very rarely. A three-block reorganization happens almost never, um, et cetera, et cetera, and it gets harder. By six blocks, you assume that the amount of effort required to do a six-block reorganization is enormous. In fact, it involves spending an enormous amount of energy. But here's what a 51% attack can't do. A 51% attack cannot change the rules. And the reason they cannot change the rules is because all of the other nodes on the network that are not mining, the ones operated by exchanges, wallets, merchants, and users, intermediate nodes, everybody else on the network, will not accept the new rules. Meaning that if the 51% attacker starts to operate under new rules, they will find all of their blocks rejected by the rest of the network. And what they will achieve effectively is a hard fork. They will fork themselves into an altcoin that is not accepted by anybody else. The same thing applies about creating fraudulent transactions. They cannot create fraudulent transactions, because those transactions and the blocks in which they are mined will be rejected by the rest of the network, because every node validates every transaction and every block. Meaning that a 51% attacker cannot change the rules in the long term, they cannot change the rules in the short term, they cannot produce fraudulent transactions, and they cannot produce fraudulent blocks, including blocks that lack the necessary proof of work. And in order to produce real blocks that have the proof of work, in order to sustain a 51% attack, they have to spend electricity. Which is why they can't go back and change the whole chain. In order to go back and change the whole chain, let's say they picked a point in the past that was 100 blocks past. To go back into the history and change something that is 100 blocks behind you, what you have to do is remine the last 106 blocks, and do that in the same amount of time that the other chain is mining one block. That is impossible to do. So you would have to do a sustained attack, where you start 100 blocks in the past, and then apply 51 percent, so that you can achieve dominance. It may take you 1,000 blocks before you manage to pass 
because as you mine block minus 106, the other side is mining block plus 1. Then you mine block minus 105, they mine block plus 2. They are still ahead. Minus 104, plus 3, minus 103, plus 3, minus 102, plus 2. Oh, we're catching up now, but very, very slowly. Minus 101, plus 3, minus 100, plus 4. See, they're still ahead. Right? All of this time, they're ahead. In fact, none of what you're mining is being accepted by anyone. Now assume that a thousand blocks into the future, you finally, finally catch up and pass them, because that one percent difference allows you to mine just a tiny bit faster. One minute out of every ten, faster on the blocks you're mining. But because you started a hundred in the past, it's going to take you a long time to get ahead. You pass them in a thousand blocks. The entire block saying flips over to your side. Now, here's the thing: you manage to get all of that reward, but you only get it once, meaning that you spent all of that energy rewriting a hundred blocks into the past in order to get paid a reward. Now keep in mind, if you have 51 percent of the mining power, that probably means that before that you had 49. 49 percent. Until you got to 51 percent, you were probably mining together with everybody else. Which means that out of the hundred blocks that you just reorganized, 48 or so were probably mined by you in the first place, which means you already got paid for that energy use once. Now you spent half of that energy again, and you're not getting paid again, because the second payment is going to overwrite the first one. You, you have to choose. If you rewrite the chain, you're only getting one of the two chains, the one in which you got paid for 49 blocks, or the one in which you got paid for 100 blocks. But you spent the energy twice regardless. So you're doing twice the work for half the pay. That doesn't sound very sensible. And that's just 100 blocks into the past. That's not even one day's worth of blockchain. To change a thousand blocks into the past, to change a year of blockchain, it would take more than a year, two years in fact, at 51%. It would take you two years to mine one year worth of transactions. And at that point, the other side will have mined one here too. So it will take you even longer to pass them. So this is why having 51% isn't a winner-take-all scenario. In fact, the amount of stuff you can do with a 51% attack is really limited down to one scenario. That is, you can go to an exchange, you can withdraw the money from your Coinbase transaction that you did, or from a spend that you did on one chain, then reorganize and double spend that money, and then go to an ex another exchange and withdraw it again. So you've withdrawn twice, and the exchange has lost money. Now, of course, in order to do that, you have to manage to wait for six confirmations, remine six whole blocks. Do that secretly without anybody noticing that 51% of the hash power just dropped off the network somehow and is mining secretly, and then pop back onto the network with six pristine blocks that came out of nowhere and hope that the exchange didn't change their confirmation time. Because if I'm running an exchange and I see 50% of the hash power disappear for a few minutes, I'm going to be like, okay, here we go, someone's playing games. Let's change our confirmation time to 10 blocks, just to make sure your entire plan is now thwarted. You're going to have to go even further back in order to remind this. Um, let me change it to 12 confirmations, just for the next day or two. Let's see what these people are doing with that 50% hash power that dropped off the network. It is a very difficult attack to, to do. It is a very expensive attack to do. It is a very risky attack to do, and it has very little possible benefit. Which is why, in the entire history of proof-of-work chains, we only ever see this happen in chains with very, very low security, that are either at the very beginning of their proof-of-work, or have had a catastrophic collapse in their proof-of-work due to a fork, and therefore become vulnerable to exploitation, because people can shift large amounts of hashing power. 
It has never happened in Bitcoin, and it is even harder to happen in Bitcoin, because in Bitcoin, we have the benefit of dedicated ASIC equipment that cannot be switched from another chain, because it is not really used in other chains. And as a result, it is all already in Bitcoin. You can only move it from Bitcoin to Bitcoin, which is noticeable. And that is how the security of proof-of-work works. Uh, Edmund asked the follow-up. Not sure if I missed this part. How often statistics has a 51% attack happened this far? Allow me to pull up my trusty calculator here on my computer. We're going to need to do some number crunching. So um, zero plus zero uh, times zero divided by one times zero plus zero equals. Zero. Zero times has a 51% attack actually occurred on the Bitcoin network so far. And that tells you something after 10 years about how the security of a large ASIC-based proof-of-work um, network works. And people who say that um, proof-of-work uh, through ASICs on a large scale is a waste of money do not understand the security equation. It is not a waste of money. It is money that has been well spent and invested by miners in order to buy us all the most robust system of immutability, uh, security, and protection against double spend that has ever been in, uh, invented. Connor asks, would it be feasible for a government agency to reverse a transaction which they suspect is nefarious? Um, no, it wouldn't be possible for. Um, a government agency to reverse a transaction they suspect is nefarious. Um, in fact, past a certain state, it wouldn't be possible for even miners to reverse a transaction that they um, either suspect is nefarious or they've been compelled to reverse by a government agency or multiple government agencies. Even if 100% of miners cooperated entirely, in order to reverse a transaction. If that transaction happened a few months ago or a couple of weeks ago, the number of blocks that have passed, the amount of electricity required to remine those blocks would be infeasible. Meaning that even if 100% of the miners agree to go back in time and reverse a transaction, they still have to mine all of those blocks again. And the only way to mine all of those blocks again is to spend all of that electricity again, and they won't get rewarded twice. Because when they spend all of that electricity again, they will invalidate the previous reward transactions they have already done, or they will keep them, but they only got paid once. In any case, they will spend the electricity twice, they will only get paid once, and no miner is going to do that. Um, so the security of Bitcoin is independent from the desire of anyone to reverse a transaction. Transactions, once they have been embedded deeply enough in the blockchain, are practically irreversible, regardless of the size of the adversary. Ari asks, In 2008, the computational power was much lower than today. Was it anticipated by Satoshi Nakamoto that the electricity consumption would be an important factor in the mining industry? Did he foresee ASICs would have enough power to make the calculations? Um, no. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto didn't foresee the very rapid competitive development of mining to the point of specialized chips, giant industrial manufacturing facilities and mining facilities, and the intense competition that would drive forward that industry to the point that it has been developed today. And we know that because Satoshi Nakamoto was surprised by the development of uh, these technologies and the rapid competition in this space. Uh, certainly didn't predict the electricity consumption and the ASICs. Then again, Satoshi Nakamoto didn't predict the success of Bitcoin to this extent. And you know, you've got to realize that the development of ASICs, the uh, electricity consumption, all of these things are part of the incredible security that uh, uh, the cryptocurrency uh, space has developed, especially Bitcoin. And it's one of the things that makes Bitcoin robust. Uh, having a, a giant industrial security mechanism that cannot be replicated and that requires the investment of enormous energy in order to prove 
that you are willing to follow the rules. And the punishment that comes if you don't follow the rules, where you lose a lot of money, makes Bitcoin extremely robust to attack. So the fact that A6 and electricity uh, consumption developed in such a rapid way is because it is actually profitable to deliver uh, immense security to the Bitcoin economy because the Bitcoin economy has grown tremendously and um, and th that security is being rewarded by users. It's really a simple development of market forces. But I don't think Satoshi Nakamoto had foreseen this. Isabel asks, is it true that mining pools in China control over 70% of the global hash power? And if so, does that mean there is a centralization issue and could a proof of work change be a solution? I've answered this question a number of different ways. Uh, and to me, I think it's important to distinguish between mining pools and mining farms. We don't really know um, where the mining farms or the mining pools are, how much are controlled by uh, a few actors, and how much are controlled by competing factors. And whether they can actually do anything with having a majority of the hash power is questionable. We've seen in the past, of course, that having more than 50% of the hash power doesn't really result in the ability to compromise the network in a meaningful way, because the incentives are not aligned across the system. But whether it's a centralization issue or not um, is something that's debatable. But I'd like to focus a bit on the second part of the question, which is, could a proof-of-work change be the solution. And I've heard this being suggested a number of times, and I'd like to disabuse you of this notion because I think that would not, in fact, be the solution. For the first ten years of Bitcoin, the development of ASICs has proceeded at a frenetic pace. Until ASICs got down to about 16 nanometers of silicon fabrication, the pace of change from the initial uh, mining that happened on CPU to GPU to FPGA to the first primitive ASICs that were done on 60 nanometer and 48 nanometer and 40 nanometer technology, finally down to uh, you know 26, 24 nanometer, 20 nanometer and below, we saw enormous increases in the processing power of ASICs. An interesting phenomenon occurred during these times, whereby ASICs became obsolete very, very fast. In some cases, and during the height of this period, between 2013 and 2016, we saw ASICs being obsoleted as fast as three months. Meaning that you buy a new ASIC, you run it for three months, and three months later, it's already being superseded by another ASIC that is already at least five to ten times more efficient. And therefore, the hash rate increase and difficulty increase wipes you out from a profitability perspective, and you have to replace the ASIC. The companies that operate in today's mining farms have become extremely adept at turning around their entire infrastructure as quickly as you can imagine. They become experts at the logistics of bringing in new ASIC equipment, racking it, and dismantling and recycling the old equipment as fast as possible. They basically learned how to change the entire industrial infrastructure of a multi-hundred million dollar uh, industry every three months as the technology moved fast in order to maintain a cutting edge. So, the miners who have the greatest success today are the ones who learned best to play the game of throwing away all of their equipment every three months and replacing it with brand new equipment straight from factories where they could deliver designs and fabrication as quickly as possible. Guess what happens if you change the proof of work algorithm? Who has the biggest advantage? All of the other users who are doing the one CPU, one mining, or perhaps have a home GPU? Or the miners who have a billion dollars in cash sitting in their bank account, and also have access to the factories, the logistics, the operational skills to turn around a new ASIC on your new proof of work algorithm within three months. In three months, not only would all of the miners be back in the game with this new proof of work 
algorithm, they would now dominate it to a greater extent than they did before, just at the time that we are finally seeing competition. You see, something else really important happened. By 2016, we started hitting the edge of Moore's law, which means that the ASIC miners that were built in 2016 and 2017 were about at the edge of what cutting edge silicon manufacturer for commercial chips, uh, such as the chips you see in your smartphones and your CPUs and your GPUs on your desktop machines are. Meaning that there is no more 5x improvement in performance for ASICs. ASICs now hit Moore's law. Now Moore's law is tremendously fast compared to technological developments in other industries, but compared to the previous speed at which ASICs were being advanced, it's actually very slow. So going from 5 to 10 times increase in performance every 6 to 12 months down to a doubling in performance every 2 years, well that's a very big change. It's a very big slowdown. And what that means is if you build an ASIC today, it is likely to be viable and profitable within the Bitcoin mining industry for at least two years, possibly three years, before the next generation of chips comes out at the cutting edge so that you can replace it. So the pace has finally slowed down. And what this slowdown has done is it's delivered the ability for miners to compete on a broader level, and it's beginning to diversify the mining environment. It's beginning to allow chip manufacturers to build competing chips and distribute them to users in a way where they're still profitable after two years. It would be catastrophic at this point in time, just when the concentration of miners are losing their primary advantage, which is the ability to turn these chips around faster. And just when there is a bit of competition to change the proof of work algorithm and hand the entire mining industry back to the dominant players who would be able to retool in three months with the new proof of work algorithm and then compete even more effectively with their cash reserves. Essentially, it would be handing the industry to the dominant players. No. We don't need to do a change in the proof of work algorithm, and in fact, it would be counterproductive. Lewis asks, transaction validation and script construction. I would like to learn more about transaction validation and the two types of scripts to validate transactions: a locking script and an unlocking script. And how do these operate in transactions? Paul also wants to learn more about this, so let me go into that for just a tiny tiny bit. Now, we talked about uh, Bitcoin addresses. Um, and in the past, we talked about addresses in general. We talked about how the address represents the double hash of the public key. Now, when you uh, tell your wallet, send crypto to this address, your wallet in the background constructs a transaction, and in that transaction it puts a special script. I'll talk about Bitcoin specifically. Other cryptocurrencies may use slight variations on this general idea, but often it's a similar type of approach. Um, so in the case of Bitcoin, when you say send Bitcoin to the address one blah 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 blah, and it's a one address, a, a traditional a double hash of a public key address. What your wallet does is it constructs a transaction that has an output with a locking script in it. And what the locking script is is a script in the Bitcoin scripting language that says, "Check that whoever tries to redeem this presents a public key that, when double hashed, matches this address." that I'm trying to send money to, and a signature that can be validated against the public key we just double hashed. That script, which is take the public key, double hash it, check the, against the Bitcoin address, and then validate the signature, is called a pay-to-public-key-hash script. 
Um, it's a classic script that you'll see. It's the first lesson you see when you learn about scripting in the Bitcoin scripting language, and that is the locking script. So when you create a transaction that says pay one bob uh, as an address, and it's a one address, your wallet actually creates a transaction that says, I am locking this amount of Bitcoin to the paid to public key hash locking script that will match this address. And that's the locking script. Now that money has been locked against that locking script. If the recipient of that, the person who owns that address, wants to spend it, they have to present an unlocking script that, when combined with the locking script, unlocks the amount. And that unlocking script is a public key that they own and a signature that they can generate with their private key. And since they're the only ones who have the private key, only they can produce this unlocking script. Now, when you take the unlocking script of public key and signature, and you match it against the locking script of public key double hashed Bitcoin address check signature, and you put them together, it takes the public key that's unlocking, it double hashes it, checks it against the Bitcoin address, and if it matches, it will then check that the signature also matches that public key for that transaction. And that means that together the locking and unlocking script allow you to send money by locking it to someone who can show ownership of a Bitcoin address. And the person who owns the corresponding private key is the only person who can construct the unlocking script that fits that lock in order to release that money in their own transaction to pay someone else. And so each time a transaction happens, it is a sequence of unlock this, unlock this, unlock this, and then lock it here, lock it here, lock it here. The simplest transaction is one input, unlock this amount, one output, lock it to a different script. Um, and these get chained together, where each unlocking script refers to a previous locking script, and each future locking script can only be unlocked by another unlocking script that locks amounts to another locking script, etc. etc. So bits of Bitcoin are basically getting locked and unlocked and locked and unlocked in each sequence of transactions as they change ownership or as the value is moved from one Bitcoin address to another. I say moved within quotes and I say send within quotes because of course Bitcoin is never transmitted, it never moves. Uh, it's locked to one uh, locking script and then it's unlocked and locked to another locking script. The Bitcoin hasn't moved. All that's changed is the effective control of that Bitcoin uh, by changing the locking script uh, and the conditions on which this amount can be spent. Um, so that's the process of what's happening behind the scenes. And we're going to talk about that with a bit more detail in, in, future, um, in future lessons. Marcus asks, how exactly is the signature of a transaction verified by the miner or node? Um, so first of all, signatures on transactions are verified by every participating node, not just miners, but every node running on the system, including any wallet that sees that transaction. Um, a signature is again a number. In fact, it's a pair of numbers, and uh, out of tradition, we usually note those as R and S. Um, R and S are the two parameters of a signature. Think of them as two numbers, and they are produced through a mathematical formula that takes your private key and a message that you want to sign, which is the transaction that you're signing, and um, uses the private key to uh, produce a signature, which are these two numbers R and S. Uh, there's another component in though, which is the generation of a random number as part of that process, and that is uh, a critical component of that. But I'm not going to go into that much detail. 
Let's say you take your private key and the message, and you produce a signature R and S. The unique thing about the formula that is used, the algorithm that is used to produce those numbers R and S, is that anyone can then take the numbers R and S, the message M that you signed, and your public key, not private, your public key, and can do a calculation that validates that the signature produced was produced by the private key um, without knowing the private key. So if you can validate when you have a public key and a message and a signature, that that signature uh, could only have been produced by someone who had the corresponding private key um, without having the private key yourself, uh, that is the basis for digital signatures. And that uses a mathematical trick in the elliptic curve field. Uh, one of the tricks about the elliptic curve, as I mentioned before, is that you can't reverse certain types of uh, calculations on the elliptic curve. And it uses a trick, um, a mathematical trick, that gives you that with signatures. So a signature uh, that is produced with a private key can be verified with a public key. And that way, when you sign a transaction with your private key, and other people can then verify that signature against the public key, they know that you signed it um, without you revealing your private key. In the case of a Bitcoin transaction, uh, when you sign a transaction, you also produce the public key. Remember, previously, it, uh, um, an amount of crypto may have been locked to your Bitcoin address, not your public key. But if you want to sign to unlock uh, that script and spend that amount of Bitcoin, uh, you have to also produce your public key. And that's verified against the Bitcoin address. It's verified against the signature. And then people know that you are, in fact, the authorized owner of those funds and are authorized and control them through your private key to spend them. Adriano asks, Transactions not included in a block. What happens to transactions selected by miners that don't solve a, a don't become part of the block? Do they go back to the network and wait for the next block? Are nodes that are not mining receive any awards? Uh, okay, first of all, nodes that are not mining do not receive any awards. Now you remember I talked about this idea of a reservoir, or in fact every node having its own reservoir or copy of a reservoir where they where they put transactions that haven't been confirmed yet so they can keep a track of what transactions are not yet confirmed and waiting for inclusion in a block now this reservoir is obviously very important the mempool is what it's called miners have this uh, mempool and they use it to collect transactions in between blocks so that when they're ready to produce a block uh, or to try to solve a block, they have transactions to put into that block so they can earn fees. Um, when they take transactions out of that uh, mempool and they put them in their candidate block, if that block is successfully solved and propagated to the rest of the network, as other nodes in the system see that block, they will look at what transactions are in the block, and they will remove those transactions from their own mempool, um, because they're no longer unconfirmed, they're confirmed. They're now in a properly solved block, and so the queue gets shorter. If you think of it that way, uh, the queue of remaining transactions gets slightly smaller every time a block is solved. Now there are some circumstances where blocks may get rejected um, after they've been solved, and what happens then is really, really simple. Uh, if a block is rejected, and we'll talk about that when we talk more about forks. Um, then all of the transactions that were in that block, if they're not included in another block, will get dumped back into the mempool so they can wait their turn again. Uh, they don't get ignored, they don't get forgotten, they just go back in line and wait again. And they'll be once again sequenced by priority of fees per byte, uh, so that the ones that are paying the highest fee get included in the next block, etc. etc. So transactions don't get uh, dropped uh, if they're included in a block and that block is invalidated. They get queued again in the mempool to be included in the next block. If a transaction just sits in the queue, 
um, and doesn't get included in a block, usually because its fees are too low, uh, then eventually that transaction will get dropped from the mempool. And each node decides how long it's going to keep transactions in the mempool, how big its mempool is going to be. Uh, and that depends on how much RAM it wants to allocate to the mempool function. Um, but effectively, that transaction will eventually get dropped from the network. And your wallet uh, may need to create a new one with a higher fee or retransmit it, hoping that this time the network uh, is more empty and it has a chance of getting through even with a low fee. I'm confused by the terms Bitcoin address, hash, digital signature, public, private key. What is the difference between these terms and how are they related to mining, transaction validation, and security? For instance, if I'm paying a merchant through Bitcoin, do I send the merchant the hash? Please explain. How is my identity as an independent node represented on the Bitcoin network? So, all great questions, Eric. And this is indeed a very confusing topic for many people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to address most of these questions in one kind of cohesive way, if I can. And we'll start in terms of your control over your wallet. Now, you may have heard me say in the past one of my slogans, which is not your keys, not your coins. And this applies to Bitcoin. It also applies to any other cryptocurrency where uh, you have a decentralized system. In order for you to be in control of the funds or smart contracts or any other activities on a blockchain, you have to keep control of your keys. So, Let's start with the private key. Of course, the private key, as the name suggests, is the part of your key pair that you must keep private. Now, what is a private key? In simple terms, it's a number. It's just a very, very, very long number. And when I say very, very long number, if you wrote it down in decibel, it could be up to 77 digits. Long. So imagine if I said pick a random number between one and nine 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 and I just kept going like that seventy seven nines in a row. That's how you pick a private key. Well, you don't pick it. Your wallet, either a hardware wallet, a software wallet, a smartphone wallet, or whatever, will generate a random number inside that range. And that random number will be your private key. The chances of you generating the same private key as somebody else are practically zero. Um, and as a result, your wallet can independently generate it. In fact, you can generate your private key without any contact with the Bitcoin network. It's not registered per se. It's not recorded anywhere on the blockchain. Um, and none of your identifying information is recorded uh, anywhere in the system. So if you run your own wallet, or you control your own keys, or you generate your own keys manually, um, then you can do that without any online connection. You don't have to be online to do this. You simply have your software pick effectively uh, a very, very long random number. Now, just to explain um, how this works, you could also um, generate this very, very long random number um, yourself. Uh, one example that people have used is if you take a coin and you toss it 255 times, then you've got, uh, sorry, 256 times, then you've got a, a very large random number that produces uh, a key. And it's in binary. Uh, you say heads is zero and tails is one, or the other way around. Doesn't really matter. And then you toss that coin 256 times. You've generated a very large random private number. Then you don't tell anyone what that number is. So that's a private key. Now, with with uh, asymmetric cryptography, as it's called, or public-private key systems, you don't just have a private key. You also then generate from that private key a corresponding 
public key. And as the name says, the public key is something that you could reveal. Now, in Bitcoin, we don't, and there is a security reason for that. We'll talk about in the answer to one of the other questions. Um, but the bottom line is, the public key then becomes the basis for your address. So, it all starts with a private key, which is a very long number. From that very long number, your wallet will generate a public key. Every private key generates one and only one corresponding public key, and it generates it by doing what is called a scalar multiplication on the elliptic curve field. So what that means is uh, you multiply uh, a specific point on the elliptic curve by your private key, um, and you generate another point on the elliptic curve, which is your public key. Now, it's a bit confusing, because what does it mean to generate a point? Uh, and what does it mean to multiply a point on the elliptic curve? It, it, it might be confusing at first if you, if you think of it as multiplication, but let me give you an example. Um, if you call your private key lowercase k, and you start with the elliptic curve generator point called g, then your public key is simply k times g. But one way to write k times g is simply to write it as g plus g plus g plus g, and just repeat that addition um, k times. So if you simply add the elliptic curve generator point to itself um, as many times as whatever your private key number is, then uh, you will end up on another point on the elliptic curve. And this one of the properties of the elliptic curve is that if you add a point to itself, the result is another point uh, on the elliptic curve. So when we say a point, what we mean essentially is an x-y coordinate on a curve that satisfies the equation of the elliptic curve, and that point becomes your public key. Those x-y coordinates are your public key. The most important thing to understand here is that this is a one-way operation because there is no such thing as division. Uh, on the elliptic curve, meaning that if you produce this public key by multiplying uh, your private key and the generator point, there's no way to simply divide by the generator and produce your private key. That's impossible to do. The only way to do that is to try all possible private keys, also known as a brute force attack, which is impossible because there's too many of them. So this is a one-way relationship, and the basis of all cryptography lies in these one-way functions, uh, which can be computed very efficiently and easily in one direction, but are impossible to compute in the other direction without brute forcing all possible values. So the private key is a number. You use a one-way function of multiplication on the elliptic curve to produce uh, an x-y coordinate point on the curve called your public key. We take the x and y uh, coordinates and we smush them together and produce uh, simply a long string of numbers, uh, which is how we represent the public key. And under normal circumstances, you as a user never see this public key. It's used only in the process of signing a digital signature in a transaction. We'll talk about that in just a second. So the public and the private key have this one-way relationship, but in Bitcoin we don't use the public key directly. Instead, we go one more step with a one-way function called a hash. So we take the public key and we feed it into two hash functions called SHA-256 and RIPEMD. Now, by passing it through these two consecutive hash functions, we produce another number, and that number is then represented as your Bitcoin address. So, private key, one-way function, public key. Public key, again, one-way function, which is the application of hashes, to produce a Bitcoin address. That means, effectively, that a single private key that you've generated randomly can be used at any time to produce the single public key that belongs to you, and then from that public key, you can use it to produce the single Bitcoin address. A private key will produce a single public key, and if encoded in the same way, it will produce a single Bitcoin address, and that way you have a chain. Meaning that 
you can go from the private key and reproduce the public key and the Bitcoin address anytime you want, because you have the private key. It's in your wallet. That's the thing you own and control, which gives you control over funds that are stored in Bitcoin uh, and other cryptocurrencies and blockchains. And that is the basis by which you prove your control. Now, once you have your Bitcoin address, um, you can then give that to a merchant. The Bitcoin address that you give to a merchant is effectively the double hash of your public key. They can't see your public key because, as I mentioned before, hashes are one-way functions. They can't go from the Bitcoin address back to the public key. But uh, if you later present with a public key, they could confirm that that corresponds to the hash that you sent them. They will then construct um, a transaction. Uh, so let's say if you want to pay a merchant, they show you their Bitcoin address. If someone's paying you, you show them your Bitcoin address. So the Bitcoin address um, is used to receive payments. And the way it's used is that when someone sends to uh, a Bitcoin address or address, um, what happens behind the scenes is that a certain amount of funds are locked using a locking script, and they're locked in such a way that only the owner of the private key can unlock them and produce a signature uh, proving that they own the private key. How can you create an offline address? And then, how does the Bitcoin network know about this address if you've never been online? How will the Bitcoin network find out about this address? And this is really interesting because uh, it speaks to a fundamental aspect of the system, meaning that addresses are just numbers. You could pick one out of randomness. Um, you generate a key, of course, not an address directly. You generate a key out of randomness, just picking a number at random from a huge range of numbers, and that produces a unique Bitcoin address. Unique not because you check that nobody else has it, unique because the chance of someone else has it is about the same as winning a million lotteries in a row. Uh, so the bottom line is that's how you create these keys and addresses. Now you've created the address the network doesn't know. The beauty is the network doesn't need to know. That address doesn't exist until someone tries to send money to it. Um, and when someone tries to send money to it, then it becomes part of the Bitcoin network. So let's say you generated an address offline. And in fact, you don't even need a computer to do that. Um, you could use dice, uh, playing cards, uh, a coin. Uh, flip a coin 256 times, write down the 0, 1, tails and heads numbers, produce a 256-bit private key. Uh, then go through the laborious manual exercise of converting that private key into a public key with elliptic curve multiplication. It's very difficult to do, but you can do it with pen and paper. And then go through the even more laborious process of doing SHA-256 on paper and RIPE-MD on paper, and you could produce a Bitcoin address. Not only one that hasn't been online, one that has never seen a computer. It's just a number. You just did a series of calculations, and now you have a Bitcoin address. Great. Well, you could uh, then give that Bitcoin address to someone and say, send money to it. and They could type it into their wallet, or if you're really adventurous, you sit down and you draw a QR code by hand. That is also possible, and they scan it. But let's say you're not that adventurous. You just give them the Bitcoin address. They type it into their wallet. They construct a transaction. That transaction will consist of sending or spending an amount from their own Bitcoin funds uh, to your Bitcoin address that has never been seen before. Specifically, actually, what it's doing is it's constructing a locking script that says, upon presentation of a public key that, when double hashed, is equal to this Bitcoin address and a digital signature that matches this public key against this specific transaction message, um, you may release these funds. And so that transaction is recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain, and it just sits there. 
if nobody claims it, maybe that Bitcoin address uh, was generated in a, in a weird way and doesn't even have a corresponding key. That's called a burn address. It doesn't need to be a real Bitcoin address. Of course, if you lock funds to uh, an incorrect or fake Bitcoin address, then those funds effectively become locked forever, because there is no unlocking script that can release them. However, in the scenario we just discussed, you actually wrote down uh, in binary a private key that you constructed by flipping coins or whatever. And that private key was the basis of the Bitcoin address you gave your friend. So you actually have the ability to construct an unlocking script. Um, so then you could either import that private key into a wallet and spend the money that your friend sent you, or you could even construct a transaction by hand that says, here's an unlocking script, here's the public key, here's the digital signature, please spend this money. And if you transmit that transaction to the Bitcoin network, it will match the unlocking script to the Bitcoin address you produced earlier. It will say that means you are the correct owner, it will be a valid transaction, and you will spend the money. The Bitcoin network doesn't need to know about addresses, um, because addresses effectively are just locking scripts. And if you decide to lock something uh, or an amount, uh, to a locking script that is invalid or doesn't correspond to an address anybody seen or even corresponds to an address for which there is no key what you've effectively done is you've buried treasure without a map you've locked a lock without a key and that money is gone forever uh, it can never be retrieved because there is no valid transaction that can unlock it but if you do have a valid key behind that the Bitcoin network doesn't care. It will sit there with a locked, with the locking script. That amount will sit there locked up until you present the unlocking script that allows you to spend it. And until then, the Bitcoin network doesn't care. It just sits there. Which also has another interesting implication. How many Bitcoin are sitting there with locking scripts that cannot be unlocked, or for which the keys have been lost, or for which there are no keys? The answer is, in many cases, we don't know. Some are obvious. There are some addresses and locking scripts on the Bitcoin network today that have locked funds that we know mathematically can never be unlocked. Those Bitcoin are lost forever. There are some that are locked to addresses where the keys have been lost, and we don't know that they've been lost because it's impossible to tell. Um, there will never be an unlocking script uh, because there is no private key, or until at least a quantum computer can produce a private key uh, by reverse engineering that address. And even that is very tenable um, for the next several decades.